origins of life, a problem for physics? I had the question mark. Sarah, what is the relevance of the origin of life to physics? I mean, I can see for biophysics, but why is or, uh, it a problem for physics as a whole? Yeah, so, well, I think people confuse physics with the problems it's studied in the past rather than a way of thinking about the world. So the, the issue I see there is that because we've come to kind of a deep fundamental understanding about parts of reality, those are confused with physics as a discipline rather than thinking about this idea that physics is really predicated on trying to look for deeper abstract principles that are really explanatory and have a large breadth of explanation. And so with the origins of life, I think that's really critically important because I find it hard to believe that life doesn't have some deep fundamental explanation. Um, and in particular, in the field of astrobiology, when we're talking about whether there's other life out there in the universe, we really need universal principles. And therefore, when you cast it in that kind of framing, it becomes a problem for the mindset of a physicist as far as how do I abstract this problem to its essence? And then how do I develop a mathematical understanding that allows me to predict features of examples of the system that I've never encountered? Um, and I think that's actually really the program for astrobiology is we don't want to just you know, have aliens hit us in the head or something. We want to actually go out in the universe and look for them and predict where we should find them. And the, some of the research I've seen you involved in particular in the paper is kind of straddling the interface between information and complexity as well as uh, life proper, you know, life qua life. And I wonder, you know, I, I don't want to have this, con I don't want to ask you this question, even though people like Lee Cronin told me to ask you this question. Um, I kind of get sick of, uh, of, of me asking it, although I'd love to hear your response if you like, but it's the famous question posed but not answered by Schrodinger, what is life? And I just find it um, a little bit, you know, it's like Wonder Bread or, or something like that. Uh, you know, it's, it's, yes, it's technically a, a question, but is it a good question? Maybe we can ask that instead of you defining for the nth time as you've done so skillfully. Um, is, it, is it a proper question or is it sort of like these why questions? You know, why is there life? You know, is it is a different question than what is life? So what do you make of it? Well, so first off, I'm not, I'm a physicist that's not afraid of asking why questions, which is maybe why I ask a traditionally non, or a non-traditional question in physics, um, is that I, I don't think that we should be scared of those questions because I think by the practice of asking a why question, you ask things differently than if you didn't consider the why, which means your what questions are better informed uh, because they have some deeper principles underlying them. The what is life question, I think, is ill-posed because it makes some assumptions about um, life as we understand it being a natural kind or being actually a category in nature. And usually when, at least if you look at the history of physics, it's not like we were asking what is gravity before we came up with the idea of gravity. We were asking other questions like, why do the planets have regular motion in the night sky? Or why does this apple fall from the tree the way it does? Or why does this, you know ball roll down this inclined plane. Um, and then we came up with this kind of unifying explanation that we call the laws of motion and the laws of gravitation. And I think when we're approaching the life question, there's a lot of assumptions that because we are life, uh, we know what life is. Um, and therefore, we can just go in and define it. And what is life actually makes sense as a question. But I think as you dig down deeper into that question, it starts to make less sense to pose it that way. So the way that I like to think about the question is, what are the laws of physics that would have features associated to them that explain the phenomena that we call life? Um, and that's a little bit of a mouthful, but I think what, what the simple way of saying it is there's something underneath the phenomena we call life that's probably a pretty deep explanation. Um, and we should really be trying to derive the properties of life, not define them. Right. And I think maybe we could we can even start there by, um, you know, recapitulating some of the notions of, of emergence, which which you've spoken about before. But I think my audience would would get a kick out of hearing it from you. I, I always say, you know, life is kind of like the uh, Supreme Court's, you know, 1950 something definition of of pornography. It's like we know it when we see it uh, and we but maybe we know it when we don't or we know what it is when we don't see it, you know, uh, more, more likely. But but I wonder the confluence of information and life as an emergent phenomena and the concomitant you know, question of how does consciousness emerge, uh, a lot of people maybe conflate, maybe erroneously, I don't know, I'm not an expert like you are, but consciousness as being a prerequisite to understand life. In other words, can you have life without consciousness? 
uh, certainly there wasn't maybe conscious life uh, before, you know, human beings maybe or something like human beings. Um, and yet there was life. So I, I, can you talk about this emergence? And as Morrison said, you know, more is different. And so, uh, first of all, what is emergence and why is it why is it relevant potentially to the origin of life? Yeah, so um, emergence is this idea that you can get new properties at new scales of organization. So like if you think about, you know, reality being separated out in scales, which is really not, it's just that we do that because we have to build models of things. Um, you know, there's the atomic scale and then atoms come together to make molecules. And then maybe when you're talking about living things, you get cells and cells come together to make multicellular organisms or people come together to make societies. And when we're looking at each of those different spatial scales, uh, we see um, fundamentally new rules emerging. And so this is one of the reasons that Anderson said more is different. It's not the same at every scale. We actually see new properties. And one of the things that's probably the most mysterious about emergence is it seems to be the case that you can describe these scales independently of having to refer back down to the lower level scales. So a lot of, so for example, we can talk about social dynamics without having to appeal to say QCD or something, right? So we don't need to have those theories of like how the very basic component parts work to understand something at a high level like that. Um, and so uh, in sort of our traditional concepts of science, that seems kind of deeply mysterious because people think, or well, there seems to be some conflict um, as far as, well, well, are these genuinely new properties um, or, is it the case that if we really had a giant supercomputer and we could run, say, the um, interactions of all the elementary particles in a social system, we'd actually really recover those high-level dynamics? Um, and of course, this gets into more issues of, um, like, let's say maybe um, something like metabolism. You know, like I'm eating. Is there a particle description of what it is for me to be eating? Um, but then there's also the question: Is there a particle description of what it is for me to feel hungry? Because um, feeling hungry, hungry seems much more subjective and intrinsic to the scale of organization that I operate on. So there's some questions in biology that seem much more apparent that some kind of emergent um, description is actually necessary. You can't really reduce it to the particle description. <laughs> 